last time I was on a stage like this, a beautiful uh, setting like this, I, had, I, was on, I was up in the Hyde Park Opera House. I was part of a production in which uh, I made a fool's bet, turned out my daughter won and I was the fool. <laughs> and I was part of a winter production of uh, the best Christmas pageant ever in the historic Hyde Park Opera House. And it strikes me how similar this is in structure and space and feel and how important it is to have spaces like this for our communities and for our people to come and enjoy and make them stand for a long time. So I appreciate your efforts in being here and your engagement with this process. There's a ton of things about emergency management. I teach emergency management at the college and uh, as well as being an EMD from Cambridge for three and a half years and the, I'm the EMD in, uh, for the college now. I'm part of the association. I stick my nose into just about everything I can. And there's a ton of things that go with it. But we can start pretty simply and we can use small bits to make this all understandable. So I'm gonna just gonna talk about the basis of emergency plans, how, they're, how we know how to make a plan and how we're gonna be effective at it. The first thing I'll start out with is a, a quote from uh, General Eisenhower, which is that plans are useless. Planning is essential. And the reason he says that is because it's never gonna look exactly like you think it will when you're making your plan. That was one of the last things Ben said was, when we're, we can't prepare for the last disaster. It's going to look different, so we're gonna prepare for the next disaster. How do we do that? By being flexible in how we design our plans. The basis of any good emergency management plan is to understand the actual risk, the hazard that you face inside a context, and then you'll be able to know what you're facing and then what you can do about it. So this is, and I'm not gonna to go too far into it, but what we're gonna talk about, this is called Thyra, Threat, Hazard, Identification, and Risk Assessment. It's part of a much larger framework, welcome to the world of emergency management. Just so you know, I never figured I would be on stage. I'm Mr. Dark and Stormy, I've spent my entire life in public safety. You know, my wife and I went to grocery shopping, she's, look, she's a graphic designer. She's looking at the Uncle Ben's rice and she's like, oh look, they redesigned their packaging, the colors are very warm, the texture on the photo is really nice. I'm looking over her shoulder going, that guy's a sex offender. <laughs> she's like, stop. I'm like, no, I read the email on him last week. <laughs> I have spent my whole life showing up at bad times. And one of the things I love about emergency management is it's one of the only places that I've found where I can put all my experience responding to bad things into action during good times and have the chance to reduce what happens when things all do go wrong. You're entering into a whole system, a whole framework of being able to anticipate, being able to potentially mitigate, maybe even prevent bad things from happening. And they're all over. The, the picture is very dramatic, of course, Irene flooding. Of course, flooding is not just Irene. The, the last time that the wrong way bridge flooded in Cambridge, it was uh, April because the snow melted. That's kind of what happens out there. Thankfully, and there's no infrastructure that's really at risk when that happens as a regular occurrence, but it's something that happens all the time. We also face other risks. Now, one of us in this room haven't heard at some point recently about an active shooter event, mass homicide or attempted mass homicide. Yeah, there's been a fire somewhere. Brattleboro lost a, a whole block a couple of years ago. And there's some risk out there at any given time. This is a system that can be used to identify all of the different potential risks, rate them in terms of the outcomes and the, the likelihood and the outcomes, and then how to best apply our resources because we're all dealing with limited resources. Inside the world of Ben and I and the folks who do emergency management as a whole thing, we're up here in the identifying and assessing risk and estimating capabilities section. Before we can get to building capabilities, before we can get to validating them, all sorts of things that go with this. The thyroid process is actually pretty simple and you probably do this in some other way without recognizing it. 
The first thing to do is identify the hazard, the threat, the risk, the concern. And I'll use the, the words hazard when I'm speaking about a natural occurring thing. Flooding is a hazard. And I'm using the term threat about a man-made or a person-caused thing. And whether that's a cybersecurity, whether that's a car through your front <laughs> your office, is the lesson really, watch out if we hire you to be in charge of everything? Because <laughs> there's just this little, there are words, it, it's over 40 years, that's fair, that's fair. I, I've worked with some folks that just seem to have this little dark cloud, and I'm just, I'm just conscious of that. With <laughs> uh, Give the threats context, and then establish what you want to be able to do with the capability target and then develop what the resources are that you would need. These are the four steps in conducting a Thyra, and from there, you can end up building a plan. This is just about as mathematical as I get. I was an English major, so this is letters, and then I don't actually have to come up with a number works for me. But this is just a way of conceptualizing the, how this works. The threat, whatever that thing is, we're gonna name it, we're gonna call it, we're gonna say that it's flooding, it's a, it's a hostile intruder, it's fire, whatever we need to call it. The vulnerability, what is the risk in this space? Okay, I'm gonna say this is a lot of old wood in this space. I would not want a fire breaking out here. Okay, so this is a high vulnerability to fire in this space. And then what are the consequences? How many people, uh, if you've ever heard of the station nightclub fire, 100 people killed, and they were almost all killed right at the front door they came in. Even though there were two other viable exits, people didn't use them. The risk, the vulnerability, that's, and actually um, state fire code requiring crowd managers uh, for any event over 50 people and more than one for every 250 people based on fires like that, the, uh, the Iroquois Theater fire, the Beverly Hills fire, where hundreds of people die inside spaces. So the consequences, what can they be? And then what's that total risk package? Another way of looking at it, a little bit easier graphic to view, is if we have the probability, high to low, and the impact, low to high, what are the things that we may suffer, what, what may happen? Ben talked before about fluvial erosion that the river decides it's gonna go. And by the way, Mother Nature, kinda bigger than us, if she decides the river's going this way, that's how it's gonna go, at least for a while. Inundation flooding, another significant risk. This is straight out of Vermont's. Uh, I, I didn't create this PowerPoint, I modified it along the way. But this is straight out of Vermont's uh, threat hazard assessment. It's actually an exercise that they do annually. We're gonna be at it tomorrow and uh, Thursday down in Killington. They do a three-day exercise. I'm only there for a day and a half of it. But this are the, what we face here in Vermont, the highest ranked things. Ice storm, you'll notice that the ice storm is relatively likely to happen and relatively low impact compared, high impact compared to some things, lower than some others. Why? We've gotten kind of good at this. We know how this works. But when 1997 came around, nine, or the, one, the January 98, it was a mess, wasn't it? Everybody remember that one? Just a couple of years ago, we had the same thing. And, uh, and we had, you know, at one point, what was the, Ben, what was the estimate? Literally half of one of the power companies' uh, customers out of service. It, it literally half, 50% of the people because of the ice storm. We have a system set up for that where we'll have trucks from Canada and trucks from Pennsylvania and line people, line workers come up and repair these things, but it's also an identified risk, and we know that. So we're gonna spend time and infrastructure and money in trying to mitigate those kinds of risks. Uh, and interestingly, so in Cambridge, if you've ever gone around the wrong way bridge, that bank is hardened because we know that river is going to flood. We know that happens to be an area. So the state has, transportation has built that bank up so that it can take that kind of flooding. There are other roads that were the same amount of water to run across it, it would just wipe them away. We figured out this is a space we armored it, we dealt with it. Winter storm, very likely to happen, but overall, not that much of an impact because we know how to plow, we're used to it. I laugh, my brother lives in North Carolina. Three inches of snow, they're done for. He, he can't go to the grocery store for a week. 
I called him up my first year in Vermont. I came here for college in 90, uh, 92, and I called him in January 93. I was at Linden State, up on the top of the hill. It was a wicked cold winter, and I'm like, oh, Scott, it's so cold up here. He goes, yeah, I know. It's been cold down here, too. Last week, I had to put on a sweater. <laughs> I was like, shut up. <laughs> it's not nice. So when we identify the risks, we're going to find the highest risk things, and we're going to say, how do we deal with these? How do we mitigate these? This is where our first dollars and the largest number of dollars, our first effort and the largest number of effort are going to be uh, disease outbreak, you can see. Probably not really for the arts and culture, probably not the thing you need to worry about most. If there's an outbreak going on, it's public health. If there's an outbreak going on in their recommendations, you know, if you have an exhibit that gets touched a lot, then put some hand sanitizer next to it, things like that. That's all good. Not where you need to invest your dollars, even though it's in the news a lot. If you were uh, up here, like I didn't look out back, but it seems like we're kind of high up. Flooding is probably not the biggest risk for this theater. Anyone check me on that? We're a little bit higher up, right? So I'm not worried so much about flooding here. Somebody down the river, somebody down a little closer to, obviously Weston, that's going to be the concern. Here, we would use this process and come up with a slightly different answer than this. And that's OK. That's the point. It's flexible. It's here for you. From there, the state loves these little diagrams. From there, this is everything I've said already. You identify what the threat is. You give the threat or the hazard context. You establish the capability target. And then you say, what is it that I need to do to get there? How does this work? This is a silly little example. I want to hike up on Camel's Hump. It's a little kind of granular. Yeah, you can read that. OK. <clears throat> I want to go hiking on Camel's Hump. I got a couple things I got to keep in mind. One, I'm kind of sensitive. I got sensitive feet. I don't know. It's a thing. I always need good insoles. I, my left one bothers me, my right one. So I'm going to have to have good boots that are going to not make my legs hurt when I'm going up. Last time I went hiking, weather outside, right? It was 40s today, so I don't want to get up to the top and then be really cold. Things I have to keep in mind. If it's a five-hour hike, there's no facilities along the way. This is some context. Uh, the top third of the mountain is above the Clermont Anyone hiked Camel's Hump? Right? It, you know this, right? This is all stuff. And that's what I'm saying. This is a process you know. You just don't know you've applied this in this setting and how to move it into, uh, into the world of emergency management and protecting the stuff you do. It's a gorgeous view up there, but that top third of it is above the thermal climb. Uh, there's no trees left, it's just scrub, and it gets wicked windy up on top. So you're going to need to know that you need to bring a jacket. Uh, let me see the next one. Uh, yeah, removable layers, right? We're out hiking, that's an old thing. Okay. And then when we get up, when, when I get up to the top, I'm going to want to sit. I'm going to want to have a, a bite to eat. I need to have some snacks with me. The time I went hiking, the last time I went hiking up there, ran up, a, went up and got up having my little peanut butter and honey sandwich. And uh, another crew managed to get up there with a six-pack of beer. And I'm like, dude, you guys beat me. I just got a sandwich. I suppose they had to figure out how not to get too shaken up <laughs> going up the mountain. So this gives us context. This gives us some capability targets. This gives us some resource requirements. Once we do that, we're going to say, OK, what do we have and what do we need to get? So if I have lots of granola at home already, but I don't have any protein bars because I ate them on my last hike, I don't have any peanut butter, but I got plenty of honey. I know what I need to run to to get to the store. I also uh, need to make sure that if I just bought new shoes, that I have transferred my insoles, got new insoles. I don't want to be sore. I need to make sure that I actually grab my coat, my light layers, whatever it is. Just yesterday when I was wearing my boots, these are actually brand new shoes, so I'm actually doing OK for once. I feel good. Now that I know that, I know that the week before, I'm going to swap my insoles. I'm going to go buy some food supplies. And I'm going to make sure I pack a light jacket. I've got my little list. It's all stuff we've done before, right? At some point, you know. Anyone ever travel with kids, right? <laughs> there was a, an, uh, NPR this week. They were, they were uh, uh, two, about two weeks ago, I think it was actually. They uh, did one of those little blurbs. You know those little blurbs where they do? They're just kind of funny news. They just throw it out there. Uh, a state was trying to, to revoke a woman's license plate, 
and she ended up winning the argument and keeping, you know exactly where I'm going with this, right? The license plate was P, B, four, U, go. <laughs> Clearly she travels with kids a lot. <laughs> That's a little bit of an emergency plan. Hey kids, you know, you run through the checklist. It's the same thing. Here, this isn't so silly. This is our beloved historic building, okay? We're going to look and say, we want to protect this from flooding water damage. So, I don't, yeah, there's no sprinklers in here either, so that brings us back to fire risk in this building. If there were sprinklers in here, that would be a separate risk to the historic building like this, okay? If there's a, if there was a shop down in the basement, like a carpentry shop, I would really be concerned if there wasn't some kind of fire suppression system here. I'm not trying to ding on the, on the, uh, on the theater here. I'm just saying that we've got to be conscious of where we're at and, and the risks. So in our context, we'll go back to the Weston Playhouse. They know that they're in the floodplain. They know that they're concerned about uh, risk. In fact, we heard how they were conscious of what a three-foot flood would do and move stuff out of the way. And just They weren't expecting you know, the whole damn river to come into play. So if we're worried about flooding and water damage, the building is within the 100-year floodplain. And again, the FEMA maps that are out there and the 911 maps that are out there that overlay the, 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 uh, the flooding, again, that's inundation flooding. That is not the river deciding to move or overpowering its banks. That's just if it's a lazy Sunday and all the water backs up. But the other thing we need to consider, especially in an old building like this, a water line might break. If uh, the bathroom window gets left open and it's uh, you know zero degrees outside, 10 below, that might freeze up the bathroom, then the pipe bursts, and we soak everything downstream of that, below that. We want to be able to protect our stuff. Knowing that, uh, we know that we have a lot of paper historical articles. Actually, uh, going up, anyone remember, in actually the very first meeting that started this network, we had a presentation from UVM from the Fleming House where the, the, was it Fleming House? No, it was it, herbarium. the Herbarium, yes. Where they had just barely finished moving the majority of their collection into waterproof containers when the building caught fire and the firefighting effort poured water all over everything. And if they had not just finished that project of moving everything into those waterproof containers, they would have, their just 100 years of stuff would have just been gone. So they were proactive. They said, this is a risk we face just because we have sprinklers, just because I don't even know what the genesis of them wanting to do that was, but I know that they actually saved themselves a phenomenal amount by engaging in an active process. So if we're conscious that we have historical items, papers, articles, whatever, and we need to protect our paper records from flooding, then we determine the volume of materials to be protected, what the right storage system is. Now this comes into the assessments of what's money, what money is available, what functions, what space. I can't tell you and no one can tell you what's right in your space. This has to end up being a decision you make based on the logistics, based on the, the need, based on the resources you have available for connecting with people. This might mean that you identify that you need to uh, make some kind of a capital campaign or uh, an outreach campaign to get what you need. It might be based on the restrictions of the space that you're in. Maybe there's things that just can't be done to retrofit this space. Maybe you can't lift a 200-pound, uh, eight-foot steel cabinet up the only flight of stairs you have because the, the stairs are too tight. Up on St. Mike's campus, we have the old, uh, the old uh, Hero Theater, and the stairs just wind all the way around. There's no way you can get most of what we would normally consider like, oh, this protective equipment, you can't get it in that space. So what is the best you can do? What's the mitigation? But the thought process behind this, it was uh, down in Wilmington where the town clerk realized when the river was rising during Irene <clears throat> that all of the land transfer records were handwritten into books and the ledgers that were down in the basement of that building, which was right next to the river. And they spent a couple of hours walking downstairs, grabbing an armload of books, walking them up to the second flight of stairs, putting them in a room, walking back down. And sure enough, the basement flooded. And that was millions of dollars in transfer records, tax records, time and effort that would have had to have been recreated or just lost entirely with no way of getting it back. 
if they hadn't done that mitigation project right there in the moment. Better to have that happen uh, intentionally, have it ahead of time, because if the river was rising at two in the morning and she wasn't there to think of that in that moment, there would have been no way to fix that. So from there, we know that if everything is in boxes in the basement, uh, if we have an upstairs office, again, this is, you have to say, decide what works in your space. But this is the foundation for how to write a plan, how to create a plan, how to put one in place. If, it, if we were talking about an active threat and a hostile intruder comes into this space, what would we do? We need to understand where the, where the exits are. There's a great example with the uh, magician being able to say, I'm gonna perform my next act out there, everybody follow me out. Uh, I've actually been in stage productions before where something from the, you know, the smoke machine set the fire alarm off and, and then everybody's like, is that part of the show? You know? and, and so somebody has to jump up and this is a crowd manager and if you don't have crowd managers, be conscious of that because it's actually state law that you, uh, the fire code that you have to follow. Have somebody go up and say, folks, this is not part of the performance. We need everybody to follow some basic directions and have a plan for how you're going to direct people out of there. And in fact, it might have even been an option in that case. Even though the threat wasn't to fire, maybe that's the easiest thing to do to, because everybody knows how to do that. Because let me just say, you know, if I, hey guys, uh, I just want everybody to stand up. You know, there's a bomb, maybe. So, you know, if you just comes off kind of rough, right? <laughs> Versus, hey, pull the fire alarm. Sorry, we got to interrupt the show. Everybody step out because of fire alarm. We're all going, oh, fire alarm. Oh, bring my jacket, bring my water bottle. How are you doing? Okay. It's a much less of a, 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 a traumatic thing. If we thought about that ahead of time rather than trying to make it up in the moment, then we'll probably succeed better. From here, uh, the other thing, cooperation from other incidents. We know that Vermont, the snow melts eventually. And, uh, and that that happens if it does rapidly, especially if a storm system's coming through at the same time that the flood may uh, you know, happen six years ago. Uh, three years ago, someone left the bathroom window open. Things like that are context. You can look around either in your facility or you can look around for other buildings in your area or other venues or places like yours and say, what has happened here? And I assure you it has happened here. One of the key things we keep pointing out in emergency management, and again, I'm Mr. Dark and Stormy, this is my whole life, is that it has, and therefore it will again. In Essex, in 2006, I was one of the police officers that responded to the shooting that took place in that school. Okay? It has happened here. Okay? Fires all over the place, flooding all over the place, ice storms, it has happened here. It's broken sprinkler systems, they've happened. So we do need to make sure we're aware that we're being conscious, that we understand that there, what we face is real, and our responsibility, our obligation to the people that come into our venues, to the people that have donated to the venues, to the people that have given their, their, their lives and their sweat and their tears, and the space and the people that need the art and cultural opportunities and experiences. We have that obligation if we're the stakeholders, if we're controlling the venues, if we're in charge of the shows, uh, I was just talking with Tom just a minute ago. Were you hiding in the back? He must have run out. Uh, even, the, uh, even the fair, the street festivals, what happens? I'm, dark, I'm Mr. Dark and Stormy. What happens if somebody drives a truck into your crowd just like they did in Nice, France? You know, it's, that stuff exists in the world. That's, and that's the difference between hazards and risks. The other thing else, anyone from Middlebury here? Excellent. So... I got a buddy, he's a cop in the, on the Middlebury Police Department, and every time we get a thunderstorm, I open the radar app on my phone, and I look, and I because I love thunderstorms, and I look to see whether I'm gonna get any of the, the good storm. I never do, wherever I am, but Middlebury gets hammered every time, doesn't it? Every, no matter which direction the storm's coming, it runs right through Middlebury like a freight train. If you're having some kind of outdoor festival and you've got the little tent canopy thing set up all over the place, you need to have a plan for what happens when the wind kicks up and those things start rolling like tumbleweeds 
through the aisles. Something to be conscious of. We can do this in every space. We can do this for every event, whether we're inside or outside. The, some bad thing has happened, and there is some way to protect, to mitigate, to make sure that we don't have it bad, as bad as it could be because we were prepared. Believe it or not, that's the basis of how to, what you're going to end up writing your emergency management plan on. Now, writing a plan is a whole separate conversation, but you can already go back, start looking around your space and go, hmm, this might work, this might not. We don't have a resource to deal with this. We should look at that because that's a gap. That's going to be how you end up coming up with a plan. I'm probably way early. You are, but you can take some questions. I'll take some questions. And then anybody, any other questions that uh, need to be had from anywhere along the line as well, because I doubt I have that much to talk about, on this topic anyway. So um, <laughs> we're coming on our 10th year of the River of Light Lantern Parade in Waterbury, which is an outdoor event yes. at night with two or 3,000 people. Um, and so... What do you recommend for a plan? <laughs> Absolutely. So here's the thing. Anywhere you, anywhere you have people, you can have problems, right? We're all human. So, that I, and again, I'm, I'm not exactly the optimist. My wife does the rainbows and sunshine. I don't. Um, so traffic control and the venue control are one of the primary things. If this is going to be, if there's any way to be able to solidly block off the area where it's going to be out of service for a while, Get the fire department to park their truck blocking this, or Waterbury, get the construction vehicles. They're all there anyway. <laughs> it's a mess. It's a mess. I know they're doing good work, but so have those vehicles. Hey, this section, this section, this section are going to be blocked off. Park vehicles on this side, park vehicles on that side. That gives you the whole space to protect from a vehicle borne incident. From there, the next thing is probably just education. Because there's not, it's not like you're going to, uh, in a wide open venue, it's not feasible, it's not really possible. And also, it's not really in the context to try and set up a metal detector everywhere because the risk really isn't that high. You'll notice back in that, the, you know, the crosswise, it, active, active shooter wasn't even listed because it's such a rare event. By the way, I know, I know some of them just went, what, really? It happens all the time. It actually doesn't. There's, when you look at the FBI standards for what an active shooter event is, attempted mass murder with a firearm, it actually happens about 20 times a year in the United States. That's the average, 16 to 20 in the US. That's a lot of square mileage, hundreds of millions of people, 20 times a year. Less than 200 people die in these events each year. More people die from the flu, okay? We don't see that because we're being constantly inundated with the media images and with the politicals and, uh, and, every, and it's very emotional and all that's valid. But be conscious that it's not actually as high of a threat and as imminent as we're being kind of just processed with all the time. So we don't want to live, especially in a celebration like that, with the idea that we have to have Fort Knox around us. That's not reality. So if you take some basic precautions about put vehicles here, vehicles there, and actually we face a greater risk from a drunk driver crashing into the crowd than we do an intentional homicidal act. But that vehicle would protect against that just the same. So the fire truck or the, or the construction vehicle and giving us a nice safe space in between to just have a good time and then move them afterwards. And from there, have people conscious that, okay, Waterbury doesn't have its own police department anymore. So make sure that somebody recognizes that the state police, have you reached out and have a liaison with the state police? Are they likely to have a presence there? You have two officers there? Fantastic. Then you've handled 90% of what's going to come up. You also have a, a, a fire department and a rescue squad. They know they're going to be involved in the planning. They probably have a plan about we're going to have a dedicated ambulance crew just for the festival and an ambulance crew because they have at least two trucks that's still able to take the medical calls from anybody else that has their issues knowing as an event organizer what the fire department has for a plan. Does it just go right on Main Street, right in front of the fire department? No, it goes, no. It comes from Stowe Street, then Main Street to the right, to the park. To, okay. Gotcha. 
So the fire department is going to need to make a plan. Okay, this is the road, this is the road, this is the road that are blocked off. You want to, as an event organizer, know what their plan is to get, if, it, if whatever their other unrelated emergency is on that side of things, how they're going to do so that you can help them. So that's a conversation where you have a planning meeting with the fire, rescue, the state police. Just a probably a one-hour coordination meeting. Everybody loves coffee and cookies. And have a quick conversation about this is what you would want to do, and this is so we will be able to expect how to help you out best. A couple of you know, a couple of things just to keep you know that incidental from happening, and you've got ninety percent of a plan right there. We have one more, maybe time for one more question in the back, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Hi, my name is Shanna Bowler. I'm from Middlebury College. Um, I'm the arts events manager at the Mahaney Arts Center. Um, I have, uh, I just want to first of all say that all of my student ushers are trained crowd managers um, and that we are all trained crowd managers. I can't recommend that enough. Even if you have volunteer ushers, it's just really important that they have some basis of knowledge um, in that. But I had a question about um, accessibility. We've been working on that a lot at Middlebury and so we've incorpor we're incorporating how to evacuate folks with disabilities mm -hmm. um, during all of the emergency scenarios and I wonder if you have that at St. Mike's, if you have included that in your plans at St. Mike's. Absolutely and, and by the way I work with you folks from Middlebury and your public safety counterparts quite a bit. They're really on the ball and doing some great work. So yes, we have to be conscious when we have a person, a student that is in a wheelchair that we don't put them on the second floor of a building because in a fire alarm, the elevator drops to the first floor and waits for the fire department and you can't use it. So our housing assignments have to be based on where a student will be able to still get out of the building under their own power. We have a student with actually a medically sensitive to temperature, so we're actually adapting uh, the fire, uh, the fire evacuation plan to that person be shelter in place, much like uh, the Department of Health in Burlington on 108 Cherry Street has a cafe that is uh, staffed by people who are visually impaired. They're not, it's on the second floor, they're not going to be able to find their way out a hall, down the stairs, out, you know, onto the street. So they have an area, what's called an area of refuge. And yeah, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not either, but it's better than having them fall down the stairs and break their neck. If the fire department knows that that's their job is to get to that window and get them out of there because it's part of the plan. Right, so in an art center, we don't, people don't come with plans, just right. like they don't come with IEPs, they don't come with... Which is why plans which are useless. Which is why plans are very, very helpful, yes. Right, planning. So if you've thought about this ahead of time in your space, then, you know, so someone coming back in here, usually there's a cutaway, like there's two or three chairs that aren't there, right? Right where the camera platform is, that's where a person would be able to set up with a wheelchair because they're not, they don't have to be in the... In the uh, in the hall, walkway, things like, that's already in part a plan. The next person, the next thing is for your person uh, who's a crowd, crowd manager to go, one or two people say, it's between the two of us to get that person out that door or that door, whichever one is available, one of the two of us is responsible to do that, that way you have redundancy in your system and you have a, somebody that's definitively tasked with that so that it doesn't get missed. We have time for one more. I noticed on your, uh, Doug, I noticed on your risk and um, outcome uh, assessment diagram, it doesn't have long-term electrical outages or grid failures. And I was just thinking about this hall, you know, like mm -hmm. if the power went out for uh, two days in the middle of the winter and that uh, the heat would stop, the pipes would freeze, the alarm systems would fail, the internet and phones would be down, the door locks might fail, and there would be no lighting after the emergency um, light batteries um, were used up. Yes. So just curious about how the state thinks about that and what kind of planning for grid outages, um, if it's not going to be in the risk diagram, you know, how, how do you plan for it? Absolutely. So the, the power, and, and I'm not going to speak for the state, but I'll tell you I've been involved in the, uh, in the planning process, and the long-term power outage is actually a whole separate system. This is just this was one example that wasn't comprehensive of everything the state's considered. Think about New York City. If you live on the 99th floor of a skyscraper and the power goes out, right, you're either not getting groceries 
or you're not going back in your house after you do. But even, even beyond that, how, if, you get down, if you do get down to the store, how do you use your debit card if they don't have any power either? Remember the, the blackout they had a couple of years ago? It was a squirrel that got into a transformer and blew up a part that they didn't have a replacement for. And it took days to get New York City and have the Eastern Seaboard back online. And all of those things are risks. In that case, it was during the summer, so heat stroke and exhaustion was a risk, as well as fresh water, which we've all become accustomed to, but you can't get up 99 floors without electricity or power. Absolutely right. Inside this space, it wouldn't be the state's obligation to figure out what to do, but it's great that you've thought of it. So if the power goes out in this space, you might have to consider whether you need to find the water valve, the, the, the water main, and turn that off and open the lines to bleed them out so that they would have room if they froze to, uh, to, expand, to expand and not crack the pipes. That would be part of your long-term power out plan. Uh, the batteries, the exit sign's going dead, not your problem, because if it's out for two days, you're not having anything in here anyway. Lock the doors once you've secured the building and tell everybody we'll be back when the power's on, and you don't have to worry about that light, so just wipe that concern away. It's identifying those kinds of things and thinking about them ahead of time. I, my, when I'm doing active threat presentations, I say, I try and get everybody to be paranoid for five minutes a day. I want, I, want you to, I want you to be here, I want you to be in Hannaford, I want you to be in the bank, and I want you to, this all goes wrong right now. Insert disaster here happens, what do I do? I, I can see that there's uh, a, a door there, I can see there's an exit sign there, so that probably goes right outside. I can, you know, I, I, I've been in a lot of bad situations. I've been an EMT, firefighter, Coast Guard, I'm a cop, all sorts of bad things, and I have thought all sorts of ways, this goes south, what am I gonna do? Do the same thing. Be paranoid in your space for five minutes a day and figure out what would you do. And then actually pick it up and do it. If you're going to like move this thing or pick this chair up, actually pick it up. See what it's like. That muscle memory, that's building a plan. Again, not because the plan will work, but because planning is essential. All right. Thank you, Doug. Very helpful.